Thank you, Melissa, for that introduction. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how many of you have been to uh, a city like Nairobi. Um, if you go to Nairobi, you'll find that you have much of the technology that we would have in London. In fact, the 4G signal, in my experience, is better in Nairobi uh, than it is in London. And so people in major cities in sub-Saharan Africa are embracing the digital revolution and using digital technology to really expand and develop the economy. But go 50 miles outside Nairobi, and this is what you'll find. You have households that have no access to conventional infrastructure. There's no electricity, there's no water, there's no sanitation. In fact, there is only one universal piece of infrastructure in the world, and that is the mobile phone. You will get mobile phone technology and mobile phone signal in a village. It won't be 4G, but you will have mobile phone. So we have a digital divide. We have cities where people have access to all of the things that you would expect, and we have rural areas where people are still living decades, even centuries behind in terms of their ability to access infrastructure. This is not a pretend photo. This is real life for millions and millions of people. There are 1.2 billion people in the world who don't have access to the grid. 600 million of those, that's 10 times the population of the UK, live in sub-Saharan Africa. People are using kerosene lamps, they're using candles to be able to read. And so you've got this very strange situation where individuals have got smartphones, which is perhaps 20-year-old technology, and using candles and kerosene that the pharaohs would have understood perfectly well. So how do we get power to individuals who don't have access to the grid? Well, conventionally, it would look a bit like this. We'd build a very large power station, and then we would create a grid which would take that power to the individual. The problem with that is that the cost and the time taken to be able to roll that out is simply not viable. So let me look at perhaps a different way of doing it. Here is another type of power station. Now, that may not look like a whole lot like a power station to you, but in the top right-hand corner of that calculator, you have solar power. And that device has just enough power to provide the power needed for that device. So that's kind of the beginnings of an interesting idea. Instead of starting off with power stations, which generate huge amounts of power, and then trying to distribute those, how about going the other way up? How about instead providing just enough power for an individual household, or just enough power, indeed, for an individual device, and enable power to be provided bottom-up, not top-down, to individual households. That idea happens to work quite well. But one of the challenges of every piece of renewable technology is that fundamentally, when you buy renewable power, uh, technology, you have to purchase your power station up front. And that means you have to have capital. Now, in the West, that's difficult enough, but if you're living on 3 or $4 a day, it's actually quite difficult to find the money necessary to go and buy uh, yourself a solar power system. But here, modern technology is coming to our aid. Kenya, for example, has the highest incidence of mobile banking anywhere in the world. Something like 40% of Kenya's gross domestic product goes through one mobile banking app. And that means that you can use modern payment technology and combine that with modern energy technology to enable people to pay for their power as they use it, even if that power was renewable energy. So that photo is showing a box that has a battery in it. There's a solar panel on the roof, and we have some very efficient LED lights, very efficient televisions, and so on. And there's enough power in that box to be able to provide lighting for a household for eight hours every single night. And the customer pays a small amount of money on their mobile phone. That gives them a code which they type into the box. 
unlocks the box, and that box then works for a period of time. And the uh, economics of modern technology as such, that it's possible to price the solar power at less money than the cost of the kerosene and the mobile phone charges that it replaces. So it's one of the first examples of renewable energy where the customer doesn't have a payback time. The payback time is literally zero. The customer is making money from day one because they're paying less for their solar power than they were paying for the thing that it replaces. So that provides light into the household. It enables kids to study in the evenings. On average, kids spend about 90 minutes to two hours per day extra studying because they have solar light. And what we find is that this is beginning to help people move from uh, perhaps a subsistence <coughs> economy towards a more developed, slightly more middle-class economy. But the technology doesn't stop with just lighting. We're also looking at other types of devices that can be provided. This is an example of a 24-inch television. It comes with built-in satellite, so people can get access to 50 channels wherever they happen to be, and it will run for six hours a night. And it costs roughly twice as much per day as that simple lighting system. So now we're able to provide technology to consumers without the need to be able to roll out power stations, without the need to be able to get planning permission for grids, without the need to be able to um, get enough people to be able to consume power that we can build a business case. The business case can be built on a customer-by-customer -customer basis rather than having to build it on a national or transnational basis. And all of this is underpinned by data. Customers are paying for their systems as they're using them. All of the devices are connected one way or another into the internet. And this provides an enormously rich amount of data to energy providers. It enables energy providers to understand exactly how customers use their products. We know whether the customer switches a light on at 1 o'clock in the morning. We know whether they use their television for three hours, four hours, or five hours a day. And we know if there's any kind of a problem with the system, we can go and fix that generally before the customer realizes there's any kind of a problem with the system. So you have proactive management of uh, devices as a service. And in fact, people increasingly are thinking of devices a little bit like the way I guess Uber is thinking of cars that you're delivering the end benefit to the consumer as a service. People no longer buy a television or a smartphone or a device. They buy access to the outcome from that particular device. So how does this relate to the digital divide? Well, one of the big topics in Africa today, in the continent, is what's known as the demographic dividend. And the demographic dividend is a shift in age patterns within the population. Africa is one of the fastest growing continents in the world. There's about a billion or so people in Africa today. By 2050, there are expected to be about 2 billion people. By the end of the century, there are expected to be about 4 billion people. That means that today there are 3 million people coming into the labour market every single year. So, that's either a benefit or it's a curse, depending on how you view it. If you're able to put three million people to productive work, that's absolutely fantastic. If you're not able to put three million people to productive work, that's a crisis. And this is a graph for Ethiopia. If you look at it, what it's showing is the proportion of people at each individual age band within the population. And today, in 2010, you've got a largely sort of uh, triangular population where you've got a relatively modest number of people in middle age who are earning, and they're having to support a very large number of dependencies, uh, basically young children. 
But roll that forward 20 years, and what we see is that many of those young people are bubbling up into the labor market. And now you've got a much larger group of people who, have access, who are able to earn, who are then supporting a much smaller number of people who are then dependencies. So there is the potential for the African continent to get a real boost from the demographic dividend. But the question is, where do those jobs come from? Are we going to see Africa becoming the next big centre for software or the next big centre for textiles or whatever it may be? That's a very unclear question. We had huge migration of labour from the West into Asia over the last 50 years. But with the advance of automation and artificial intelligence, it's not obvious that we're going to have the same migration of labour from Asia into, for, existing, uh, for instance, Africa. So many of those jobs actually need to be generated locally. They need to be driven by a local economy. And one of the things that Africa has in abundance is agricultural land. In fact, two-thirds of the population of Africa work in rural areas. So how about if we can use this technology, use this energy, and use access to the digital world to enable people to be entrepreneurial, to enable people to build businesses within their communities, to increase their productivity of their farms, to uh, be able to offer services within that community, to do digital payments, to do e-health, to do e-education. That's exactly the promise that distributed energy potentially can bring. So we have people opening stores, which they can keep open from 6 p.m. at night until 10 p.m. at night, because now, uh, although it's dark, it's very easy to keep your store open. We have people setting up small businesses to provide um, clothing or other things, not necessarily for international markets, but for domestic markets, for the communities around them. And we have individuals using solar-powered irrigation to be able to increase crop yields uh, in order to be able not only to feed families, but also to be able to provide additional income. If I give you an example of irrigation, the vast majority of households in sub-Saharan Africa use rain-fed irrigation. Essentially, you have a rainy season once a year, and that's when you grow your high-value crops. And outside the rainy season, you grow relatively low-value crops. If you provide solar-powered irrigation, effectively, you can make it the rainy season all year round. So instead of having one high-value crop a year and one low-value crop, oops, you can generally get three high-value crops per year. But on top of that, the high-value crops are worth more in the dry season than they worth, were worth in the rainy season. So it is entirely possible to increase agricultural revenue for a single household by a factor of three or a factor of four in one season by providing solar-powered irrigation. Now, it's not quite as simple as that. There's a whole lot more to it than just the technology. You've got to provide agronomy. You've got to provide training services. You've got to provide all sorts of other things. But nevertheless, digital power or power and the digital services that go behind it are enabling a transformation within rural sub-Saharan Africa. So this is the vision. The vision is the connected home in sub-Saharan Africa. It's distributed power with access to all of the modern devices that you or I would expect. It's giving people the ability to access the knowledge economy and trying to break down the digital divide that might otherwise occur between cities and rural areas. Thank you very much.